Hello, my soul friend. I am so grateful and honored to be here with you in your life and part of your journey in being and loving your USG. And this conversation, I, I am sharing and recording this right afterwards. I just met with uh, Shireen Etesam, uh, who is amazing. Amazing. We had a really powerful conversation. I think you're going to love this. We got all deep into your soul versus your spirit and her 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 challenging dark times and and her book, Free to Be, which is really powerful and is designed in a way that's very user friendly. Um, so we talk about that and and just ways to really help elevate your sense of self. Um, I don't want to give it all away. There are so many nuggets in this conversation. I'll just share with you that Shireen is such a cool person. She is a seasoned media executive uh, and a TV producer, uh, entrepreneur author, transformational speaker. She has developed and started uh, more than a few companies. There's an entrepreneur as well, as I said. And she's also a certified leadership and transition coach and super passionate about this work, living life as your USG you in your soul self. Um, we talked a lot about the power of play um, as well as some other things that you might be surprised to hear that are important for feeling fulfilled and having that full human experience. Her book, Free to Be, which is uh, a six-week guide to reclaiming your soul, is out and available. And you certainly can, I highly recommend getting a copy. Uh, it's on Amazon. And she has done feature films and other productions. Um, what I love about Shireen is just her beautiful authenticity and energy. So I'm excited for you to be part of this conversation. Sit back, relax, get your favorite cup of tea. And I hope you enjoy this, uh, this in-depth this in depth and uh, soul-centered conversation. Lots of love as always. Shireen, I am so excited to be here with you. I know this is something ever since we connected, ever since I met you and we spoke and I got to get a sense of your work and what you're up to, I was like, this person has got to be on this show. You really to me, like you are your USG. You are living as your USG. And that, I mean, that is like the highest compliment. That's what we're doing here. We're all, we're all just, you know, taking that next step to be our, our higher selves, our best selves. So thank you. Thank you for coming today. I'm so happy to have you on the show. Thank you so much for having me. Excited. To, we're probably going to start you know, for those that don't know you, know your story, let's start with, um, you know, I know you're the author of Free to Be, and that's free to be a six-week guide to reclaiming your soul. I love that so much, that title. I'm assuming there were times where you didn't always feel so free to be. <laughs> no. Okay. And you also have an amazing just background and, and the work that you've been in. So I think, you know, I know it's like a big question to say, all right, tell us about yourself. But I think to hear a little bit about perhaps some of the more challenging, darker moments that, that helped you get to the point where you could write a book such as this, um, yeah. I'll let you pull the thread wherever you want to start. Um, but I think sharing that would be super helpful and enlightening for all of us. Definitely. So I, um, my background is, I, I, I tend to not like to lead with my career just because I think so often that's what we do. We have our identity wrapped around careers. But, so I always introduce myself as human. I say I'm human and what I do is such and such. So what I, my background in what I have done has been in film and television and the media world. I've also started a few companies and very much an entrepreneur at heart. And something that I've always really, really enjoyed, I went to film school, I minored in broadcasting and uh, 
made a feature film uh, out of school. It's called Walls of Sand, if you guys, if you want to entertain yourself with it. And I climbed the corporate media ladder. And fairly quickly in my 20s, that's pretty much all I did. I did that and I partied. <laughs> and, uh, and it was great. I mean, I went through my life checking off a lot of things that we are supposed to check off. And I did them well. I made good money. Um, and I was, I thought that I was living a great life. And then we, a few things happened. One was that at the time I was with my partner. Um, we were together for 13 years and I wanted to have kids and she didn't. And that was kind of our first riff. And um, so I felt very, very alone in the process. And then we ended up adopting two amazing children. And I felt very alone in that process as well. And then on top of that, we ended up moving to this like McMansion um, in Sonoma. And, and I say McMansion in that it was this gorgeous Tuscan villa with a little gentleman's vineyard, but out in the nowhere. <laughs> like I could scream at the top of my lungs and nobody would hear me. But gorgeous, gorgeous place. It actually kind of reminded me of The Shining. Did you ever see The Shining? You know, where it was like this gorgeous resort, right? And and Jack Nicholson's like losing his mind. That's exactly how I felt because I was in this McMansion away from everyone. And I tend to be very, very social and um, with a three-year-old, a one-year-old and a puppy. And mm. people would come and visit and be like, oh, my God, this place is so amazing. You must be so happy. And I'm like, I'm losing my mind. Mm. Um, so. That's what I, in the, in the book, I call that my walking dead years. And I actually, when I was in those years, I actually didn't know I was unhappy. I didn't know that I was disconnected. There was this uneasiness, but I would just suppress it, push it down. I had stuff to do. I had kids to take care of and you know, all the other life things. And then we ended up moving from um, Sonoma to Marin County in California. And, um, and my relationship started to devolve. And I didn't even see that coming because I was too busy trying to manage everything. Anyway, all to say that 10 years ago, at the end of um, 2013, my now ex and I sat down for a 20 minute conversation and, um, and it ended our relationship. So 13 years of relationship and nine years of friendship, dear friendship, um, disappeared in a 20 minute conversation and it completely turned my life upside down. And I remember laying there the first night. And I took my ring off. And the only thing I said to myself was never again. And I didn't even know what never again meant. I mean, certainly vis-a-vis -vis the, the relationship. But I think I was also telling myself, I, I can't live this way anymore. Like there is, I, I don't know who I am. I don't know why I'm doing what I am doing. And realizing that I am far from happy or satisfied. And I, I'd like to say that, you know, it propelled me into this amazing, you know, journey, um, which it did. But first, it was super, super dark. Because I didn't want to put a band aid on anything. I'm like, if this is 
what my life is like, it really sucks. <laughs> and I didn't come this far for my life to suck. And I didn't want, I didn't, it's like everyone's like, hmm, okay, on to the next chapter. I'm like, I don't want another chapter. I want a new book. Mm. So I set out on a journey and, um, and it was messy and scary and um, confusing. And then it became amazing and curious and um, strange and weird, but fun and a, a lot of twists and turns. And I started slowly seeing the light at the end of the rainbow. And um, the first six years were super, super tough. But after those six years, I felt like I really righted my own ship. And then um, the book started bubbling in me. And so basically what I did in the book is consolidate the, that six-year process into six weeks. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go... You know, we don't have to do chapter by chapter per se, but what I would like to do is kind of pull out some of the darkest times and the greatest lessons. I know you've probably heard of this, that, you know, the, the message often comes from the mess, like the deep, messy challenge. And um, yeah, I'll start there. I know we have some fun things in common to talk about too, with just being in the wild west of mess, how that can feel very unsettling. Um what might be the first, you know, section or, or lesson that you learned that at the time really felt disconcerting, felt uncomfortable, disorienting, that is really now like a huge shift for you, a huge aha or learning, something that helps you to be your you as you now? God, so many. But I, I would say that. Two, probably two different things. One, having the realization that I'm not my thoughts. That was a big, big, big thing for me. Um, because I used to wake up in the middle of the night in total panic. And I believed everything that I thought. Like if, it, if I was thinking it, it was happening somewhere. And, you know, my God, I was going to be penniless. And, you know, something bad's going to happen to my children. And, you know, Armageddon and whatever else went through my head. And, uh, and really not just conceptually understanding that we are not our thoughts, but really, really getting it because once you get it, you can't unget it. Um, you could forget, but then you can, you, it comes right back up. Um, the other is, um, is getting comfortable with the unknown, getting curious. So instead of, you know, Pema Chodron talks about um, one of my very, very favorite books, When Things Fall Apart, which I've revisited quite a few times. But the idea of being groundless, you know, the idea of us having a solid ground um, is fictional. <laughs> it, it just, it, it is. You know, it's it's ever moving, it's ever evolving, and either we evolve with it or we, you know, pay the price in many ways. And um and so to be able to surrender to that was really, really liberating in the midst of the the muck. Oh. Okay. I well and First of all, the, the, you're not your thoughts is, is, you know, that's life changing when you realize, and I'm, and I'm hearing for you that there was just a lot of probably fear, maybe anxiety, just sort of these what ifs and, and think for those listening when something so major happens. I mean, we know divorce, breaking up, uh, death. Like these are big, big, big changes that can really rock our world. And in that same vein, getting, you know, Shireen, that 
oh, and my world is actually not, it, I can't count on it being grounded the way I thought it was. Like it, it as you said, you know, that, um, that there is no real solid ground. If you are becoming more and more aware, if you're really realizing that things change, that we evolve. And so it sounds like even your concept of, you know, that grounded, it, it, that actually the ground, it's, it's kind of that groundless, like you being okay with things not being okay and changing, we're changing. Which, like mindfulness being without thought, right? So yeah, grounded, oh yeah. Grounded is groundless. Mindfulness is being mindless. <laughs> truthfully. Oh, that's so great. That's so great. I love that. I've never thought of that. See, we have all these the epiphanies here. The irony. So, the irony. I love it. So those are two major concepts. I am curious um, applying those in life. Like, and and have you stayed the course, or you know, maybe to share with others? Are you still in the TV and film and production world? Um, did that start to change? Did what you want to do change or what you decided to film change? Like, I'm curious also how it did yeah. affect your career. Um, that's a really, really good question. And one that no one's asked me, uh, before. Thank you for doing that. So I'm sitting at a very interesting crossroad in that for a few years now, it's kind of the, this work has been gnawing at me, which is what what created the the book. And I still have a lot of involvements in the film and television world. I own a TV channel and a popular um, YouTube channel called OML Television, and that continues. And I have a small staff for it. We also created OML Originals. Uh, produced a feature film called Heal. Please check it out. Um, we've got now four other projects that we're working on, one of which uh, we just restarted, uh, which I can't talk too much about, but it is very much in this new realm of mine. Um, it's basically a reality show, but different than the type of reality shows we've seen where the contestants don't um, compete with each other, but compete with their own inner demons. Yeah. Um, so, so doing all of that, uh, but I am also now speaking and it's interesting because I, you know, I've done keynote speaking, I've done panels, but all within the, media agency, film and television space, not so much in the world of self-transformation. And in this last year, I've begun doing that and I really, really like it. Um, so in many ways, the, the film and TV work are still happening in the background and I'll continue playing executive producer on various projects, uh, but I very much uh, am and will continue to, uh, I'm uh, working on an online course, which hopefully will be available um, uh, in a couple of weeks. Um, I'm also developing a workshop with um, a couple of clinical psychologists and uh, a uh, baller HR woman, um, and, uh, and a few other ventures. So yeah, there's, I'm so excited about everything. Like I wake up every day and, and mind you, I do get overwhelmed, but I'm so excited. It's just, it's more so of prioritizing because I want to do it all. <laughs> yeah. This is so interesting. And I want to come back to the lessons learned in your book but one of the things that as you're speaking, this is what I've noticed myself and with others is when you come through that incredibly challenging period, when you come through the other side with greater connection to purpose, to what you're here for, the book, I mean, says it all. I mean, I just love this, the free to be. It's like that energy. You can just hear it and see it with you and, and feel it. It's like, it's palpable. 
this is what's there, I think, for all of us in our different ways. Not everyone's going <laughs> to be at this level or do these things. And that's, that's, that's great too. Um, what does OML stand for again, for those who don't know? Oh my know? God. Um, <laughs> Not to put you on the spot, Shereen. If you don't, we can come back. If, if... <laughs> no, it's, it's quite all right. So um, it, the, the channel, um, I, which I started as a website and then it became a platform, it still is a platform. It's just OML.TV and, and the um, YouTube channel, which is quite popular, is OML Television, if you go to YouTube. and um, But it stands for One More Lesbian. Um, and I, there's, I won't go into why I named it that. And it was a blessing and a curse in that I was really when I created it back in 2009 and I didn't know what I was doing, I was really into SEO. And um, so uh, having a lesbian in the URL was a blessing and a curse in that um, it, I, it could get blacklisted um, a, like on United Airlines, I couldn't watch it. And then it was a blessing because all the SEO work that I did, if you punched in, lesbian film, lesbian TV, lesbian television series, all of that, we would come up in the first three uh, search results. So in 2020, we went through a massive rebrand and just called it OML because that's what everybody calls it anyway. So, um, and no one really knows what OML stands for, but that's what it, what it stood for. I think that's fantastic. That's such a good story. Now, I was like, I think I remember reading. And you said the film Heal. Did you help produce the film Heal that came out? It's not. It's a different one. This is a, um, a thriller. And Oh, okay. I was like, I had a lot of the people on from the other. I was like, wait, I missed that. Okay. Different. Ver no, okay, no. Different. This is, it's the it's um it's a really it's actually a really great storyline it's about a lesbian couple who go to what they believe is a retreat and it turns out to be conversion therapy so, oh wow uh, yeah, yeah and it's healed so healed i got it the other is is healed wow okay wow no i just you know it's like um I want to go back to some of the lessons, but already I can just, you know, when I, when I met you, this is one of the reasons I'm like, we've got to do this. Your energy just, it's like you're, you're plugged in. There's like a, you're, you're, you're the socket's plugged in, like you're, you're in full charge, you know? And I know you went through other periods that were not like that. And I say that because for anyone listening, who's like feeling really depleted or sad or overwhelmed or in the dark darkness time. That's why I love to have these kind of conversations because you can get out of them. They don't have to last you. I know um, I do want to get to play in a minute because that's just such a cool take the whole land with play. But I would love to hear, is there, are there any other um, major lessons or aspects in your book that because I know you teach a lot, um, that still help you today, that helped you to kind of crawl out of that really challenging space. And I'll say probably, Shireen, people probably wouldn't have guessed this with you. That's the thing. I bet if they'd seen you, they would never think this. They never would have thought you were struggling, is my guess. Yeah, but I mean, that that goes to show you, right? I mean, I, I read a um, another book by um, a a now friend of mine who is this like major philanthropist, badass, she's now retired, attorney. And I'm reading her book and like jaw dropped because like the, where she came from. But people don't see that, right? Like it's just, and that's why, I mean, it's so, so important to really not judge a person by, a, by their cover. And you never know what somebody is going through. So yes, yes, very much so. Um, you know, I, I think that so much, I wanted to go back to the, the darkness because as uncomfortable as it is, you know, there's the Rumi saying that, that says the scar is where the light comes in. Um, and I think that is so true. If we are, interestingly enough, out of all the emotions, 
one of my favorite second to second second only to love is grief um i i as heavy as it is any time it's hit me and the last time it really hit me was when my father passed at the end of 2022 Mm. Um, and it was weird because it was the launch of, it was right at the beginning of the, of the launch of my book. Like, um, we mm. were doing all the activities around it and I was just paralyzed and I told everybody, I'm like, you know what? I'm taking January to do absolutely nothing, but, but honor my dad. And he and I had so many conversations. Um, but I just, sat with that grief and sat with that grief and there is something that is so honest and real and beautiful about grief because it takes away all the bullshit you know i mean like it's just it's you and what is you know and it's and it's deep and i think it has a lot to teach us if we don't suppress it or shoo it away. Um, and I'm a huge advocate of really honoring whatever emotion you are feeling. And I talk about this in the, the heart detox um, chapter of my book, like really take care of your emotions. Just don't let it drive the bus, you know? So if you mm. need to hold your grief, if you need to, you know, jiggy with, with your joy, or you need to sit with your sadness or, you know, channel your anger, do all of those things. Just don't let it drive the bus. Don't let it rule your life. You know, that's why, and I talk about the distinction between the heart and the soul for that reason, because I think people mm -hmm. get it, get it mixed up. But I also think that so much of it is also expectation setting. You know, we so yeah. tend to look, evaluate, judge our, our lives based on exterior factors, whether it be our relationship or, you know, our parents or um, our community or society or the world, whatever it is, you know, all the, you know, we should do this and should do that. And we don't really take the time to figure out what is true for us. And frankly, we're not raised or educated to do that, right? If you are raised to, you know, as most are, you know, to get the grades and get the diploma and go to the right universities and, you know, get the right jobs and make them and the cars and the houses and all of that then that is what you're concentrating on rather than from the get-go being like, hey, you know, what is it that I truly want? Who am I truly? And and come from that place. So that energy that you're talking about, like I can't make this stuff up. It just it and and whenever I hit a crossroad now, I I call in all the powers. I'm frankly not so woo woo, you know, but I do know that whatever is whatever wisdom is coming through me is so much bigger and greater than anything that I could come up with in my mind that all I need to do is allow it. Like, that's my biggest thing, because I tend to be a bit of a control freak. <laughs> it's yeah. to get out of my own way, you know, and be like, okay, okay, you know what? I'm co-piloting. I'm not piloting. I'm co-piloting, <laughs> you know? So I think expectation setting, like allowing yourself to um, to discover yourself and and kind of unlearning what you have learned. And being okay with the messiness, you know, I, I, I just, I think everybody thinks that others are doing it right and we are not and something is off. But the truth of it is that none of us, none of us ultimately know why we're here. None of us, not one person 
in this world. None of us know if there is life on other planets. We're getting close. Hopefully, you know, you and I will know in our lifetime if if there is. We don't know why we're born. We don't know why we die. I mean, there's so many things we don't know. And and even like science and discovery. I, I, I had this discussion with my wife. I'm like, you know, all science is is discovering what already is. You know, it's like, oh. These atoms are here. Oh, these cells, you know, mixed with these cells. And this is what they do. And this is good. And this is bad. But this is, it, it's already happening. We're just discovering it. And we call it science. So not to get off on a tangent, but I just, I, I think that when we are on our knees and in those deep, dark places, it's such a fantastic opportunity to begin again, to be in the inquiry and design a, a life that is true for you. I'll leave it at that. Yeah, beautiful, Shireen, beautiful. I was, uh, when you were talking about I'm not that woo-woo, I did an episode, this came through, um, this definition of woo as wisdom of oneness which as you were saying that, it came through to me and I was like, I'm going to do, I did an episode on just wisdom of oneness. I'm like, let's rename it because what you're saying, I'm like, oh, my heart, my soul, everything about what you just said, um, you know, under, underneath it too, I don't know if this is, you felt this too, is just this deeper surrender, this deeper, you know, trust, you call it faith, you know, that, that we don't, we're not going to maybe know all of the exact reasons and why and answers. Um, and there's just something, there's something going on. There's something going on that, that is, um, that, that, that's here to guide. That's goodness. That's guiding. Um, and I think you're absolutely right. You can't make it up when you said you can't make up this energy. It's true. And as you know, beings of energy, all of us be having coming from energy, you can feel that. You can feel that. It's one of the reasons I and 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 that's, you know, I was just drawn immediately. Like, oh, there's just such you've got that aligned energy, and and to hear you went through and, and you know some really dark times and how important grief is. Like that that I haven't heard that. I think that's so powerful to be in that that aliveness of the grief to be face to face with it. Um, you mentioned something about the heart and the soul, and I wanted to just ask you to maybe talk a little more your your take on the difference and how you view those aspects of humanity and and how to tap in and anything you want to say. My my ears perked. I'm like, we got to go back there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. You hear people saying that, you know, follow your heart. The, the, the issue with the heart, and, and the heart is a beautiful thing and, and very much needed. The heart is often referred to as our inner child. And there's a reason why it's considered your inner child. You think about a child. What does a child need? A child needs to be loved. It needs to be cared for. It needs to be acknowledged. It needs to be guided. Now, do you want to follow a child? I mean, like, okay, I'm going to go and I'm going to, you know, fall down and I'm going to, you know, smear my face in paint and, you know, I'm going to, you know, oh, I don't like this. I like that. No, I changed my mind. You know, like, why would you want to follow your heart? <laughs> you know, it's just like, Take really good care of your heart, acknowledge it, hold it, sit with it when it's sad, um, dance with it when it's joyful, all of that. But it is not there to lead you. The soul, which is, you know, I mean, a lot of people you know, say, you know, what's in your gut? You know, so if if your heart is where your chest is, your your soul is, if you were to physically locate it the same way that, you know, like you can't necessarily locate thoughts in your brain or emotions in your heart. You can't really, you know, locate 
the, point to your soul in your gut, but that's kind of where you feel it, the gut instinct. And it's truly the soul that carries your wisdom. So, but the issue is that there is usually so much white noise that you can't tap into your soul. So when people, you know, people are like, oh, look within. Well, you close your eyes, you look within, what do you see? Like a to-do list and a lot of chaos and, you know, your mind's going and all of that. So you have to, and which is the first part of the book, is a lot of excavating, just excavating in order to get to your soul. And then when you get to your soul, you have to listen to it. So, and, and then it ends up being, at least at first, it ends up being this kind of like tug of war between the mind, the heart, and the, and the soul. But if you realize that the soul is there to guide the mind and the heart and the body, then there, there, there becomes alignment. So mm. that's what I talk about in the book. Beautiful. You know, I, um, I've shared this here. I, that excavation for me, it came from that really dark period of self-loathing through addiction. Um, oh my gosh. I just, even thinking about it is like, Oh, it's heavy. Um, however, if I, if, if I'd not gone through that and that experience, that excavation wouldn't have been possible. It's kind of like the diamond is not possible without being under massive pressure. And so it's helpful to hear you say this. I'm remembering, and I would imagine anyone listening, you can think about time that was now you're on the other side of, of it, the other side of the rainbow. I love that. And that, you know, I remember feeling, I remember hearing I did a lot of, of um, for me, a lot of work and time in 12 step, 12 step recovery. And it would say, like, go within. Like, I'm, not hearing anything within right now that is really so fantastic and you know it took a it took time it took patience it, and i think what you're saying with the white noise it's like white noise times 100 because if you've got just if you've got responsibilities like many of us whether your career maybe it's kids maybe it's parents you're taking care of yourself you know, all of these different things it might be health issues, other, other issues, breakups, and, and it's grief, it, you know, building that, that ability to hear amidst the white noise of, of society, of life, of your phone, of your notification, I mean, all of it. Um, I just, I appreciate this um, way of looking at it and, and just beautiful. We all have, I think, different ways of connecting in. And I know for me, that feeling of just back to the oneness, like just this greater feeling of something is guiding, is here, is present, and it's it's quieter. But to even be able to connect with that quiet, I know it took me a, it took me a long time. I mean, it took me a long time um, and to get patient too. So that excavation and that building that ability to, to even be quieter and realize, oh, that to-do list, that's not probably coming from your soul. That's going to be more of a like, you know, that's more of a human left brain. Like we just think those are important things. And so I'm really glad you brought that up. I think this is very, very important. Yeah, um, and I think I, I, I also, I think that everyone struggles with that to a degree in that, I mean, look at babies and toddlers. I mean, talk about being soulful. Like there's, right? They're just giddy. They're bubbling with life. The joie de vivre, it's contagious. And then pretty early on, you know, I mean, by the time you're three, you know, you learn what you're supposed to do and what you're not supposed to do. And, and, you know, then, you know, the ABCs and, and all of that. And at some point, and there's, you know, whether if you're in a really unsafe um, place, there is, you know, like disassociation. But I think that we actually disassociate or detach. Um, all of us to a certain degree really early on 
as we realize that, you know, like we start listening to the outside rather than, than the inside. And, and that just gets, you know, we go further and further and further and further and further. And then, you know, you get to a certain age and you're like, wow, well, I did everything that I was supposed to do. And this sucks, <laughs> you know? So, um, so yeah, so I would say that, that, that most likely everyone in this world experiences some of that because rarely are people raised with the notion of allowing their souls to lead. It's just not the world that we have created. Could it be a world that we create? Yes. Um, but it will take some massive excavating on a global level. Well, and that's exactly what I think we're doing here is, I was just thinking as you said that, yeah, it, it's going to take something. It's why everyone, if you, <laughs> you listening now, doing this, get, first of all, your book, Free to Be, like going through those different, the different aspects of how to excavate yourself, quieting, how to shift who, to be somebody who's being led by your soul. Um, we can do that. And it's, it's a, it's a big shift. You're right. We're not taught that. Most of us are not taught that at all. It's not in our society at all. I mean, it's, it's, you know, like you said, it made me sad actually just thinking about, um, if you were to chart it, I think like, as you start to get to be like three and four and five getting into school systems, you know, it's kindergarten or nursery school. There's some great things about it, but underneath it, the conditioning is certainly not to listen to yourself, but listen to the teacher, listen to this person, listen to the rules, listen to the outside. And I think, um, you know, fast forward 20, 30, 40 years, and you've got quite a, you've built up quite a bit of plaque on the teeth that um, it's, it is something to excavate. I always get that image of like, because I don't really love going to the dentist anymore. I used to love going when I was little because I'd get all those like toys and fun things. It's not so fun now because they have to like, you know, there's plaque and there's stuff on your teeth and it's similar. It like builds up. You've got to. I, I, I love that. And I don't know if the last time we spoke, I gave the, I talk about this in the book and, and if I can say it here um, as well, yeah. the, the visual, because I'm a very visual person, um, uh, example that I offer in the book is from uh, the Black Stallion. Did we talk about this? So it's, uh, I mean, I, every time I see that scene, I, I cry. So uh, for those who haven't seen the Black Stallion, do see the Black Stallion. It's a Francis Ford Coppola um film and uh it's about a boy and a arabian um horse that um gets stranded they're in the shipwreck and they get stranded on an island and at first they're afraid of one another and they slowly become friends and it's a really really beautiful relationship and so soon the boy is riding the horse bareback on the the beach and um their friendship is amazing and then they're found and the the people who own the horse want it to go to you know do what they were going to do with it so they separate the horse and the boy and that does not go well you know the horse just will not have it and the boy won't have it so they decide that the boy should become a jockey and be with the horse so they, he gets trained to be a jockey and he's a young, young boy, but he wants to do it because he wants to be with this horse. And he goes through all this training and they show all of this stuff. And then it's time for them to be in this big race. And so they are in, um, on the, in the gate and, um, you know, a lot of their people have betting, you know, for them and, and all of that. And, uh, so the gates open up and out of the gate, the horse stumbles. And um, so, and all the other horses take off and, you know, they, they quickly, you know, right their ship and start going again. But 
the the boy is really far away from all the other horses. And so you just see him and there's this close up as he's riding. Like you could just see him thinking. And then suddenly I still get chills as I'm talking about it. He starts taking off all of the stuff that his jockey stuff and starts riding the horse the way he did on that stranded island. And of course they go and they, they win the race and I'm sorry to give a give away <laughs> the it's not the total ending, but um and and I think that that's that's it. You know, instead of listening to everybody about what you should do and how you should operate and go like like really tune into yourself and it's not a one time thing. You don't just sit there and then suddenly you're like, oh, it came to me. It's a process. Really a six-week process. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, and again, once you find that, once you have that tap into that inner calling, it's, it's you, you can't undo it. You know, it's sort of like, if I may, sort of like realizing that you may have an issue with alcohol, that you're an alcoholic. Once you know that, it's very different not knowing it. But once you know it, then you have the choice of either denying it or doing what you need to do. And that's that's really how it is with the soul as well. It's like once you tap into it and you feel it, you know when you're not following your soul. Your choice. You don't have to do it, but then you know. Oh. 100%. Oh, that's, that's a beautiful story. Shireen, I would, I, I got chills and, and that idea of like taking off all of these, arm, you know, costume, armor, things that we're wearing that, that are our identity that are not us, that, you know, the, the true essence was him riding the, the horse back and probably without all of the fanfare and the fancy stuff on him. And, um, it's a good, me it's a great metaphor. It's really, I, I love what you said also, like, and this is something to get is, um, it's worth the energy, uh, and the messiness of really connecting in at the soul level, because, and I found this once you connect in, you, you can't unknow that you can't not feel that. Um, and, Maybe to, I want, I'm going to encourage everyone to get your book. I think um, you just, you're also really a really great writer and succinct writer. I remember reading through, this is a little while back now, but I'm like, oh, it just feels like I'm having a conversation with you. It felt very like we're sitting here talking, which I appreciated. Can you go through the six weeks with us? I mean, I know that's like not the whole book, but just kind of the, um, some of the main aspects and then yeah, I do. Yeah, I'll do it really quickly. Uh, so a six week process and it's in two parts. So three weeks and three weeks. And I did that deliberately because there is a lot of talk about 21, it taking 21 days to make or break a habit. And it doesn't work out that cleanly, but it's right around that time. And so you could see the the first half of the book as habits that you want to let go of, and the second part of it as habits that you want to build. So the first week is all about detoxing our minds, because I believe that's the biggest culprit. You know, the monkey mind is just chat, 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 and you know, they, the multiple studies show that, you know, up to 80% of our thoughts are negative and up to 90% of them, it's either 90 or 95% of them are rep repetitive. So getting out of that washing machine of negativity is, uh, it takes some detoxing. Um, so I talk a, a lot about that and, and about other things, like the other thing that I, I'm really passionate about is limiting the amount of content that we consume because we're on screens all day long. So the same way that we don't go from, you know, 
a fast food place to a fast food place to a fast food place just because we can. The same, like, do not consume everything that comes your way. And that's super, super important for our sanity. Um, chapter two is all about the heart and really about taking care of our heart, distinguishing it from our souls, which I, I had talked about. Um, I talked about the primary emotions and, um, and how we really need them. We, you know, and not just joy and, and love, but fear and, and, um, surprise and, and, you know, guilt and the, the complex emotions and, and such. And I actually have this filtration system in that chapter, um, which is called, uh, taser shield filter or hug. And I say to run everybody in your life through that. And, um, if we had more time, I would talk about that, but, um, it's, uh, it's a really great process for figuring out where people fit in your life and um, the hug category being your closest friends and, and the taser category being literally people that shouldn't be in your life. Um, and then um, chapter three is about detoxing the body and not just by getting enough sleep and exercising and eating right, but really shifting our relationships with our bodies as our only vessel through this life. Our body goes, we go. You look at the, the likes of Steve Jobs, right? Um, or a, a Ram Dass, or, you know, I, I can name any of it. It doesn't matter how, how much of a genius you are. It doesn't matter how much, how enlightened you are. You were born, you will die. And you may have a, a disease. I mean, these are, you can't wish them away. You can't woo-woo them away. So it's super, super, super important to take care of our bodies and also be kind to it. You know, all the thought of like, you know, you're too fat, you're too short, you're too old, you're, too, ah, 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 ah. um, so really, um, shifting our relationship with our body. And I talk about breathing and breath work and, and, um, a lot of things that are associated with our, our bodies. So that's the first, um, part of the book. And then, um, chapter four, which starts, uh, uh, part two of the book is, it seems that it's people's favorite chapter and also happen to be mine, which is on play and the importance of play. And, and, Basically, where that comes from is that when I was in my darkest moments, it was truly me playing that got me through it all. So I talk about there's eight different different play personalities, figuring out which play personality you are, because what might be play to you may not be play to me. And that's really important because um, I'm now doing various workshops and online courses and such around play. And it's really important, much like your Enneagram or your sign or whatever, it's important to find out what the other person is so you can, you can know how to play with them, how to relate to them. So that chapter is my favorite chapter, and it seems to be a lot of a lot of readers' favorite chapters. Chapter five is um, where I distinguish the difference between the soul and the spirit. I define the soul as our unique signature in um, this universe. No other soul is like yours. <laughs> your USU is you, um, your soul, and nobody shares that. But the spirit is what con connects us all. So there is the, whatever you want to call it, you know, universal consciousness, uh, awareness, whatever you want to call it, that is what unifies us. So it's really a matter of the dance between the, the, the soul and spirit, um, which is what we call enlightenment. <laughs> um, uh, I call it just finding your true north. <laughs> 
Um, and then chapter uh, six is about rewriting your story based on all the work that you've done in the previous weeks. And I um, talked about Ikigai, which is a Japanese Venn diagram for figuring out your um, purpose in life, your raison d'etre. Uh, so you could actually, which is really helpful. I try to make the whole book as practical and pocket bookish as possible because we're all time starved. And um, so, you know, whether you want to dive deep into it or, you know, spend five or 10 minutes with a certain part of the book, you can do that. So, um, and then I set you off. <laughs> Beautiful. That. That is like, and I, and I will say to everybody, you know, this is free to be a six week guide to reclaiming your soul. And I love that we come back to that. And I, I really appreciate how you go into soul versus spirit. I'm like, oh, I've thought about you as to you is your higher self, your, I love that, your soul, your, your unique thumbprint, the, the, Spirit is the oneness, the connection that we're all in part of that one. Um, I love how you put that. I just love how you talked about that. That really resonated. That really resonated for me. Um, and so fun about the play, the play uh, personality types. I was like, ooh, I think I know mine. Have to go check it out. That's so cool. Just to, you know, play, gosh, uh, this would be a whole other conversation. I'll just say this, Shereen, what I've seen and felt myself is, Play gets so like put at the bottom of the list because for so many of us that are, and I know most people listening are hyper achieving and, you know, ambitious and, and want to do all the things and get the A plus and the five stars or the six stars out of five and play it's, it's, it's cloaked in this, it, it seems not important. And, and I love that people love it most because it's the opposite. As I know, you know, it is probably one of the most important aspects. Um, and for a long time, I did not put on the list, you know, because I thought, no, 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 I've, I have shit to do. Like, this is not, there's no room. And I think that's saying something that that is the most admired chapter in your book. Well, and it's, it's actually the opposite of what people think. I mean, it's, uh, people are like, you know, why would people need to learn about play? Don't we all know it? I'm like, first, there's various play personalities. So it's important to know that. And no, I mean, I liken it to one's breath. We all know how to breathe. But how do you use breath? I mean, like meditation, that's like the, the cornerstone, the central part of meditating is is concentrating on your breath. So just because you know how to play doesn't mean that you know how to use it as a tool. I mean, breath work is mind-blowing what people do to it. And every study on play shows how it increases engagement, productivity, creativity, intimacy, you know, connection. So it's not, when I talk about play, it's not about having fun. I mean, it is intrinsically that, but it's about all the other stuff. It's about creating greater intimacy. It's about creating better engagement and being more productive and creative at work. So it isn't yeah. this frivolous thing that you do on the side. It could completely be integrated and make your life much richer. Beautiful. Before we wrap, my last quick question would be if there was one piece of advice that you had for someone listening around being their, you know, being your USU, living into your soul self, what is that advice? You know, I was watching one of the many award ceremonies this season. I can't remember which one it was. And, you know, those, those, are, I, I actually don't love award ceremonies. Um, but you know, they're always festive. And then, you know, you're looking at people's gowns and, you know, who said what and, and all of that. And I was just thinking like, I really, I, w I wish the whole celebrity culture bugs me anyway. Um, 
But I was just thinking, like, how amazing it would be if we were taught and raised to celebrate ourselves. You know, like, if we were told at a young age, you know, like kindergarten, you know what, you're going to think all of this stuff, your your brain's going to do its thing, um, but don't believe it. Don't believe it. You know, what, you know, like sit with, with like really think about what, what you love doing, five-year-old, you know, and, and know that that's really important. And, and be able to use your voice and share that, you know? So my advice really would be like, celebrate yourself, celebrate yourself and not like in a cheesy manner, but like even in your deepest, darkest moment, know that there is no other soul in this universe that has your makeup. Now you can just think, that's just one big fluke, or you can see it as a miracle. So do away with all the other blah, blah, blah that is bogging you down and, and be able to celebrate that. Beautiful. That's what comes to mind. So beautiful. Thank you so much for being here. This is such a gift and such an honor. I'm celebrating you. I'm celebrating myself and I'm celebrating everyone here who's with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shireen. Thank you. Really. I love our conversation and I hope we just continue like we do it yearly yeah. or whatever. <laughs> Absolutely. Because I'm not leaving. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm moving in. Just so you I know, love it. In. Oh, I love it. I love it. Thank you so thank much. You for being your USG. Thank you. My friend, I'm so grateful and honored to be here with you on your journey and being your USG. Thank you for watching this episode, for being part of this incredible community and this mission to really step into your light to your highest purpose. I believe that as we all do that, we all can really be our best selves and uplift consciousness and in humanity. So thank you. I also wanted to say that if you are looking for greater support right now, maybe you're having a health concern or you're looking to really step into that next version, best version of yourself, please come connect with me, whether it's for more resources or coaching or guidance. I would love to support you in any way that I can. Just go to julieresler.com. You can book a powerful one-on-one -on -one breakthrough session there. You can connect with me. I would love to meet you. I'd love to hear how I can be on this journey with you. And before I forget, if you'd like a little more of this good vibe uh, tribe and would like to digest these episodes with a high vibe community, just go to Facebook and look up the Uist You podcast community. You'll find us there. Love always. And thank you so much for taking the time and energy to truly stepping into your authenticity and being your USU.